Come on. Hey, we're diving back into our series, Sunday School, and I forgot my flannel graph. I apologize. So next service gets it and you don't. I'm sorry. Um, And it was a good one for today, but it's okay. Uh, Today we are talking about none other than David and his battle with Goliath. We're looking at these stories of our faith and how they impact us, what they teach us today. And we get introduced today to the story of David, the person of David. And just to kind of catch you up to speed on, on, on what has led to where we are today, we've introduced Abraham and God promised Abraham that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cause this, this incredible nation to come from your lineage. Uh, you're going to have descendants that outnumber the stars. That's great. Awesome. Abraham believed God. And then we get to the, the, the story of Joseph and, and Moses and uh, the, God's people, slavery in Egypt. And then God sets them free. And we talked about freedom last week and what that looks like and what the Exodus story represents for us. And then, and then you have about a 300-year period of God's people journeying with God. And there are different struggles and there are different heroes that we learn along the way. And then there comes a point where God's people, they form, they, they've become a mighty nation. And they start looking around at the other nations and they're like, hey, you know what they have that we don't have? A king. They've got a king. Hey, God, we want a king. And then you get introduced to the prophet Samuel. And the people are telling Samuel, Samuel is God's spokesperson for the nation. And people are telling Samuel, hey, Samuel, can you tell God we want a king? And Samuel looks at them and is like, hey, guys, you don't want a king. They're like, no, Samuel, we really want a king. Can you tell God to give us a king? And they're like, guys, you trust me, you don't want a king. And they're like, no, we really want a king. And so he goes to God, and God's like, okay. That's not really what they want, but I'll give it to them. Because, you see, God intended for him to be king alone in our life. Because when you give that much authority to a, to a flawed human, danger can happen. And so God was meant to be sovereign. He was meant to be king for all of his people. But Israel wanted a human king, and so we get introduced to Saul. He is the first king of Israel. And Saul was chosen by God. God saw something inside of him, but ultimately Saul turns his back on God. So God turns his back on Saul. He says, I reject you as king, and I've got somebody else in mind. He says, I'm looking for a man after my own heart, and I found him. And you get introduced to the character of David. And in 1 Samuel 16, Samuel is tasked with going to Bethlehem, to Jesse's house, and and choosing one of his sons, but he doesn't know which one quite yet. And Jesse finds out Samuel is coming to pick one of his sons, and he's like, oh my goodness, Like, let's line them up. Come on, guys, look your best, line them up. And, and he comes one by one, and this is what it says starting in verse 6. And it says, when they, when they came, he looked on Eliab, the oldest of Jesse's sons, and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees, not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. It goes on, it says, and then Jesse called, I forgot how to say his name, Abinadab, and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And it goes on and on for seven more sons. Jesse calls all his sons before Samuel, and the Lord has not chosen any of them. And then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, well, I mean, the youngest is out in the field. He says, there's one yet that remains. He's the youngest, but behold, he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, and we will not sit down till he comes And he sent him and brought him in. And now he was ruddy and beautiful and had beautiful eyes. He was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. 
And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. David is about 15 or so at this time. He is anointed king of Israel, even though he won't become king until about 15 more years later. There's so much in David's story that we could unpack, just like all these stories we've looked at. So much. I think so much, for, there's so much for us to learn in these stories. And what I really want us to catch from David's story today is David was not a perfect man, but he was the greatest king that Israel ever saw. Even though God never intended for them to have a king, he put someone on the throne who did a really good job. He did some really horrible things. But by human standards, he did a really good job, and he was a man after God's own heart. And there are some things that we can learn from David's story. And the big idea today is that God is preparing us for something now. God is preparing us now for something he has planned then. In the story of David and Goliath, we've heard this story before. If you have never stepped foot in, in church before. I promise you have heard reference to this story. This is where we get the underdog story. Every underdog story that you have ever read or watched or, or, or leaned into, every sports movie, come on, Rocky is just the retelling of David and Goliath. This is where we get this story. Someone who, there is no way that this guy could beat Goliath, this giant enemy that was standing before the people of Israel. But this is the story that we have. And he does it all with a sling and a stone. I thought it'd be fun to shoot some, shoot some things at you guys today. Can we do this? Just, it's just a small rock. It's not going to hurt that bad, okay? I got to put the microphone down. Do you see how I almost tried to talk in this? I got to put this down. It's just a small rock, okay? Just kidding. It's just a cotton ball. Sorry. How about over on this side? What do we got? Boom. Look at that. Just a sling and a stone. This is the story that we all know too well. 1 Samuel 17. J David has already been anointed king, but he's not king yet. And his brothers are fighting in the battle. They're part of the Israeli army. And the Philistines, their enemy that will continue on for decades, an enemy that they face, has come before the people of Israel. And they have a champion, and his name is Goliath, over nine feet tall. He's huge. He is a warrior. He has never lost. And they, they, th this giant comes forward day after day and is mocking God's people and is mocking their God. And no one can do anything about it. They're paralyzed with fear. And Jesse sends David one day. He says, hey, go check on your brothers out on the battlefield. Go take them some meat and some cheese and just make sure they're fed good. Just check on them for me, would you? And so he goes to check on them. He's, 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 just, he's just a good boy, right? He's a teenager, just faithful what his dad asks. He shows up on the battlefield and he hears this giant taunting the people of Israel. And starting in verse 19, I want you to take a look at this of chapter 17. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting the Philistines. David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. And when he came to the encampment as the host was going out to battle, shouting the war cry, and Israel and the Philistines drew up battle, drew up for battle, army against army. David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. And when he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him taunting God's people, taunting their God. And the men of Israel... Look at this, verse 24. When they saw the man, 
they fled from him and were much afraid. I want to show you some things today from this story of David and Goliath that you've, all, that you've heard all too well that I think you're going to bring some fresh, it's going to bring some fresh perspective to it today, not just to the story, but to your situation, to where you are in your life. Because th- we're looking at these stories and what they mean for us today. They're not just good stories to read. They're meant to impact our faith today. And I want you to see four things today that will impact your situation. And number one is this. I need you to see that not everyone will understand the calling on your life. Not everyone will understand the calling on your life. David sees this interaction and he's like, what, what are we doing about this guy? And what, what's going to be done for the man who takes this guy out? And he starts having some conversation. And then his brother, Eliab, who was, if you remember back from 1 Samuel 16, when Samuel shows up, he comes to Eliab, the firstborn, who would be the most likely to be named king. And Eliab gets passed over. And now we see Eliab again. And look at this in verse 28. Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, why have you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Was it not but a word? I'm just just having a conversation here. And he turned away from him and toward another and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him again as before. And when the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul and he sent for them. But it's important before David goes to Goliath, he has to face something that a lot of us face. Relational wounds again. Do you see this, this thread all throughout the people we've talked about already? that you and I are not unique in facing relational difficulty? This is David. Right before he's going to, I mean, you, you'd think it's like, God knows this guy, David is going to take care of Goliath, so I'm just going to make sure it's smooth sailing for him all the way up to that moment. And that's not it. He comes right into this moment where Eliab's like, what are you even doing here? Oh, and who's watching your sheep? Your few sheep in the field. Do you, it's, it's all, you've, got, you've got to read it through your own relational lens and how maybe you might interact with a brother or a sister, right? Like, what are you doing here, David? You just want a piece of the action. You just, you just, want, to, you just want to be able to say you know what's going on. Like, and David's like, man, what are you talking about? I'm just having a conversation here. And not everyone's going to understand the calling on your life. This is a difficult thing for us to come to grips with. And you need to see that wisdom doesn't not care what people think. It just weighs it against what God has said. It's not wisdom to just be like, well, you know what? Like, forget it. Like, I don't care what people think. I am who I am. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I'm going to do what God told me to do, right? I don't care if people, that's, that's not wisdom. That, there's actually a level of arrogance and pride in there, and that's not from God. David knew what was in his heart. David knew what was on his life. And he had in that moment to like, he had to wrestle with the fact that his brother didn't see it. And he does something really important there. It says he turned away. Like, I'm not going to go where you want me to go. I'm, I'm not... I'm not doing this, Eliab. <laughs> Doesn't mean that he wasn't his brother. Doesn't mean that he, he, he completely cut relationship with him. But there, there, this moment, I think, is important. It's easy to just kind of graze over it, but I think it's important. He's like, I can't, I don't have time. I don't have time to give thought to your pettiness and, and all of this, the, your, your insecurity toward me. Like, I'm, I'm just going to move on, Eliab. I can't get on your level. You've got to understand that everyone will understand the calling on your life. Number two is this. You need to know that confidence in the fight comes from faithfulness in the field. Verse 32, Saul calls for David. 
And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him, this giant. For your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, (laughs) that's cute, David. That's cute. Look at this. (laughs) I appreciate it. How nice. But you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. Where my teenagers at? For you are but a youth. No, you can't do it. Would you just 14, 15? No, you can't. 16? Nah. No, let's, let's find somebody else. That's nice of you to think that you could. I love, I love your ambition. I love your energy. But you can't. For you are but a youth. And he has been a man of war from his youth. It goes on. But David said to Saul... I love this confidence of David. Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there was a lion or a bear and he took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if it rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, the Lord, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. Confidence in the fight comes from faithfulness in the field. No one slays a giant who hasn't first killed a lion. No one is able to effectively lead a nation who hasn't first effectively led sheep. It's the small things. It's the process that we give ourselves to in our life where God does the work inside of us that prepares us for the big things to come. And I think, I mean, this message, and we're going to get to this at the end, I think there are giants in our life that we need to kill. And I think there are some things that we need to identify. I get it. But there are giants in the future that need us to kill lions today. And, and what, what's, what's a season of faithfulness that God is calling you to right now with what he's put in front of you right now that you don't know the giant in the future, but you know the God of the process and you can look at the story of David and David didn't have the confidence to take on Goliath until he first had the confidence to take on the lion. And courage accumulates in our walk with God as we walk with him and as we do big things, as we do hard things. Because I promise you, the hard things in your life now are not the hard things to come. There will be harder things in the future. But God is testing our faith. He's strengthening our faith with the hard things now. This is, I think, the greatest lesson from David. He was a man of war. He was an incredible worship leader. Most of the book of Psalms is all him. He was a poet. He's an incredible musician. Like, he, he had it all going on. But I think what David models for us the best is what actually caused God to choose him in the first place, as he was just faithful in the field. The future you, I need you to hear this today. The future you is depending on the current you to see what you are walking through now as preparation for what you will walk through then. The future you is depending on the current you, seeing what you are walking through now as preparation for what you will walk through then. This is what God wants to instill in our faith today. Confidence in the fight comes from faithfulness in the field. This is... I understand this story of David because this, it, there are parts of my story that feel like this. I left college in December of 2003. Wasn't really quite sure what my future was going to hold, but I, I just knew in my heart. Some people could say that was my call to ministry. I, I don't, I struggle with the word call. All I know is that God put a dream in my heart, a desire in my heart to do ministry. December of 2003. 
all the way to December of 2008 when we would actually move up here to help start the church that we're at right now where you, where you are. It's a five-year period where there was a dream in my heart to like, man, I want, I want, to, I want to preach. I want, I want to pastor people. I want, I, want to just, I want to be a part of what God's doing in a body of people in a city. I want to give my life to that. But little did I know that it was actually practicing my first sermon that I would ever preach while stalking the frozen food section at Walmart that was preparation for what I'm doing right now. And I could have easily been like, you know what? If I can't have it now, then it's not worth it. It was a five-year period that brought us to where we are. And then it was another seven-year period of serving somebody else's dream before I could ever even really realize the dream that God had really birthed inside my heart. I don't say that to gloat. I don't say that to, to boast in myself, but I say that there is a process that we all have to walk through, that the future you is depending on the current us figuring out. What is your faithfulness in the field right now in your life? Everybody wants a Goliath story. But where's your faithfulness where no one can see story? Today's pastures, tomorrow's preparation. And what I have found in my life is that what we don't learn, we will repeat. This is the story of God's people. It is the story of the Old Testament. It is God's faithfulness. I'm going to sum up the Old Testament right here for you. God's faithfulness to an unfaithful people. Who just, we, we have a hard time learning things, right? Anybody have a hard time learning things? And God is faithful to keep us where we need to learn something before we, he moves us on to something else. Because if we don't learn what we need to learn now, we'll never be able to do the thing then. That's part, that's part of the faithfulness and the mercy of God in our life. Confidence in the fight, which I love David's confidence. But it didn't come from, ah. I think I can do this, and God's put this in my heart to do. He says, no, let me tell you what I've actually done to proven that I can do this. I've worked. I've studied. I've done this. The lion, the bear, I've taken them out. Yeah, this is bigger than the lion and the bear, but I've been faithful to those things. I think I can handle him now because of it. Going on in verse 38 through 40, it says, Saul, you know, Saul told David, go, the Lord be with you. And then Saul clothed David with his armor. And he put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him in a coat of mail, chain mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor. And he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. And then David said to Saul, I can't go with these. For I haven't tested these. So David put them off, and then he took with his staff, he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and it was different than this type of sling, right? They didn't have elastic or rubber then, right? But it was, it, it was a sling nonetheless that you would, you would put a stone in and you would... Whew, that's how it would work. He took his staff, he took his five smooth stones, and with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Number three is this, and it really is, it hinges on the second one that we just talked about. But our identity, our identity needs obscurity with God before it can handle the attention of man. Our identity needs obscurity with God before it can handle the attention of man. David is a teenage boy standing before the king of Israel. Not only is he confident in the fight that he's going to go into because of what he has walked through and how God has used him, but he's so confident in who he is that he has the audacity to tell the king, 
I really appreciate your gesture, but I, I can't wear this. This isn't me. I can't win the fight doing it like you would do it. I have to be true to who I am. But in order to do that, and don't miss this, in order to do that, David needed years of faithfulness in the field and obscurity before God. Behind the scenes, where no one sees but God, where David is just by himself shepherding sheep and he's getting alone with God and he's getting attuned to the heart of God. He's learning who God is. He's learning who God has called him to be. Don't miss this, especially in our microwave age where we want things now. There is a process and part of that process is obscurity where no one else can see. Because our identity is too fragile and too insecure for the attention of man. Because the attention of man is going to put too much pressure on us. We're going to want to bend to this person or to this person. And we're not going to know who we are. We're not going to be confident in who God is. We're going to be swayed by this message and this message and this message. And all of us, every follower of Jesus, we need obscurity before God. We live in a social media age, and I, again, I think social media can be a great tool, but we just feel the need, myself included at times, especially as a pastor, I feel like, man, do I need to speak out on this thing? Do I, do, I need, do, I need to, do I need to let the world know how I feel about this thing? Do I need to let you know how I feel about this thing? And I don't always know the right answer to that, but we just feel this pressure, right, on social media to just always kind of post things and share our life. And I think God is calling his people just kind of back from that. Can we just get to a place of obscurity before God where we don't have to share everything and just... And just see what God wants to reveal to our hearts. And what I love about this moment is that David wasn't defiant. He didn't dishonor, but he also didn't conform. What I have found is that faithfulness, your faithfulness in the field, and and you getting alone with God before him, it will result in honor. It doesn't make you bitter. If it makes you bitter, I should be here by now. I deserve this. How dare you try to tell me? If it starts to make you bitter and arrogant, you need to go back to the field because God didn't do, there's something missing there that God hasn't worked out of you yet. But what you find in David is he says, your servant has done this. I appreciate it, Saul, but I can't wear this. There, there's, there's a tone in what he is saying that is all full of honor. And I think that's part of who he is and who God has called him to be. I stepped in to pastor this church in 2015, 2017. I had a moment like this. I loved the church that we were a part of creating. But I had to realize, I had to to come into my own identity. And I realized, man, I've been trying to wear Saul's armor. I've been trying to do something like like that was was modeled before me. And none of it was bad. It just was different than who I am. And there was a season where I had to actually pull kind of like pull back and just like, God, no, I need, to, I, need to, I need to go back to all the things you showed me in the field. I need to know what, I need to remember what you said to me, what you see in me, who I am. God, so that I can actually do what you've called me to do, because I am 100% confident that if David had went out in Saul's armor, Goliath would have beaten him. Because that's not how God called David to fight. And there is a Saul's armor in your life, and you need to figure out what that is. And you need to be confident in who God has called you to be. And if you're not, it's okay. Stay in the field. Stay in obscurity. Get alone with God. Serve faithfully. Just show up. Don't look for the attention of man. Look for the attention of God. Get alone with God him. He goes on in verse 41. It says, the Philistine moved forward and came near to David and his shield bearer, with his shield bearer in front of him. And the Philistine looked and saw David 
He disdained him, for he was a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. They keep pointing that out about David. They want want you to know David was a good-looking man. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come (laughs) to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied this day. Everybody say this day. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I will strike you down and cut off your head. How's that for a comeback? And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air, the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know. I want the whole world to know, but also everyone here watching today is going to know that the Lord saves, not with the sword and the spear, for the battle is the Lord's. He will give you into our hand this day. David said, this day. And what David wasn't saying, but his life communicated, was that I have been preparing for this day for a long time. With faithfulness in the field and obscurity for God. Behind the scenes, where God is just, it's just me and him that matter, that matters. I've been preparing for this day for a long time. I believe there are battles that we have had to fight as a church and that we have to fight as a church. That we won't win if you're trying to be somebody that you're not. If I'm trying to be somebody that we're not. Obscurity, I have found, is the secret weapon of faithfulness. And the Bible speaks to this because there's more, there, there is so much in the Bible that you don't see that is just as important as what you do see. The years. Jesus began his ministry at 30 years old. We have a couple accounts of him as a child and nothing else. What's in the nothing else? Obscurity. Faithfulness. Where no one else can see. I think there are more of those moments in our life than the Goliath moments. But we get so fixated in our, in our life, in our culture, on the Goliath moments, the big moments. When, when our, our purpose, our hardwired purpose inside of us is just first to walk with God. Just to be with him. David was a man after God's own heart. God chose David because of what he saw in the field. Obscurity. Faithfulness. I'm going to do something I've, I've, we've probably never done as a church right now, but I want to I honor somebody that she's probably going to be really mad at me for doing this. But I want to honor Miss Stephanie Miller. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You, you might not know Stephanie, but her and her husband Cliff were a part of the launch of this church. They were a part of the church before the church was even a church, right? They were here before we were. <laughs> I'll never forget, like, first time meeting Stephanie. You don't forget meeting Stephanie. Like, she calls it like it is, and I always appreciated that about her. But you know what I, what I, what I thought about Stephanie is, like, because today's her last Sunday, by the way. Um, her and her husband are moving to Florida, and it's a sad day because um, you're an OG. You're part of, the, <laughs> part of the original. But what I see in your life is just faithfulness. It's been 15 years of just faithfulness, obscurity. Not, some of you are like, Steph- who's Stephanie? You don't know. But she's here every Sunday. She's serving. She's connected. She's honoring, she's growing, like she always has been. And I think we can learn a lot from that. I think of heroes of faith, I think of people like you, Stephanie. So thank you for modeling faithfulness for people. 
I love David and Goliath moments. We need those in our life because there are giants that we're called to face. But those moments come few and far between, and everything else in the middle is faithfulness and obscurity before God. You know the rest of the story of David. He defeats Goliath, cuts off his head, shows his head to the world. Look at the faithfulness of God. It's morbid. It's the Bible. I love it. David becomes the greatest king that the world has ever known. With all of his flaws, he, he carried the title, a man after God's own heart. And I think it's because of what he teaches us about God, about the process. Ultimately, the attention of man will destroy us if we don't first have the attention of God and learn how to attend to God. The last thing that I want, to show, I want us to see today, number four, that we can learn from this story, is that we decide what the next generation will deal with. Because I think there's a really important verse here that's real easy to kind of just brush over. 1 Samuel 17, 24, all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, Goliath, they fled from him and were much afraid. And I don't blame them. <laughs> Goliath was bigger than anyone they'd ever seen. But I think it's interesting that it, when the entire Israeli military was scared to death to move forward, it was the courage of a teenage boy to say, you guys aren't going to deal with this? I will. I will. And I think we have a decision to make. We, we have choices to make as a people that we decide what the next generation is going to deal with by deciding whether we're going to deal with it or not. All the sports analogies are great, right? The David and Goliath stories, they fire us up. But ultimately, they fall flat because this isn't a game. This is life. This is, this is marriage. This is, this is kids. This is homes. This is future generations that are depending on us. The story matters because there are things in our life that we need to face right now. Romans 15, we looked at this when we went through our Romans series. Romans 15, verse 4, look at this. Whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. You're starting to see it tie together. This David and Goliath story isn't just for us. Oh, that's just a nice story. No, it's meant to actually encourage us. It's meant to instruct us. It's meant to give us hope for the things in our life that we need to face right now. There are giants in your life that you need to face. What are they? Every one of you, when you got here, there was a rock on your seat, and it's not just holding down your serve day card. I want you to grab your rock. One of the details I love about David's story is he picked five stones, but he only needed one. Because with the first shot, with the first shot, he takes down Goliath. I'm going to ask you to take this stone with you. You can ride on it if you want. We don't have anything for you to ride on now, but you can ride on it in your own time. Or maybe not. Maybe it just needs to live as a, as a memorial, as a monument for the thing that you know you need to take down. The thing that has maybe cycled through generations that now you're fighting with and you're like, you know what? No more. No more. And it, and it, and it is easy in this story, especially with a microphone in my hand, to really pump you up. You've got giants in your life. Let's take them down. And us to walk out of here, yeah! And then we go back to our real everyday lives and we're like, oh, where's that rock at? What is this rock again? Oh, yeah. 
I don't, I don't, I don't want to falsely just pump you up, but I do want to stir some hope inside of you. That the story of David and Goliath is there because it tells us that giants can be taken down. And it might not be an overnight thing for you. You might need some more faithfulness in the field. You might need some more obscurity before God, but I believe God is calling us to deal with some giants. So here's some questions for you today. What giant do you need to kill? What giants are still looming their head that you're like, I'm done with this. Serve day is coming up. We're not just doing this because we don't have anything better to do on a Saturday. No, we're, lit- we're trying to slay some giants. We're trying to slay some giants of, of, of poverty and, and hopelessness and people who don't feel valued. And we just want them to know that God sees them, that God's people see them, and we love them. Slaying some giants. There's some marriages in here that there's a giant standing in front of you. And the enemy's trying to get you to fight each other. Instead of fighting the giant in front of you, you need to name what that giant is and say, no, we're, we're taking this thing out. This is not going to mark our story anymore. There are some teenagers in here that I think, I think the enemy is telling you the message, yeah, one day, yeah, one day you'll fight some giants. But maybe you got a lion you need to kill now. Some faithfulness in the field you need to exercise now. What is it? What faithfulness do you need to embrace? What obscurity do you need to get comfortable in? I want people to see me. I want people to see what God is doing inside of me. God, I want them to see what you're doing inside of me. And God's saying, I know, but not yet. Just be faithful before me. What obscurity do you need to get comfortable with? Where do you need to get clear on who God is and who you are? This is what the story of David and Goliath teach us. And it ultimately will always point us back to the cross. It will ultimately point us back to there was a giant in our face. There was a giant looming over our lives that we could not deal with. When it comes to our salvation, in this story, we are the people of Israel. And we can't face this giant. And Jesus is our David who says, okay, I will. That's where we get the hope. That's where we get the courage. That's where we get the faith to understand that we can take things out in our life because Jesus did it for us when he went to the cross and he paid the price for sin. He has disarmed our enemy. We are fighting weaponless giants. We just need a little bit of faith, a little bit of courage, and a whole lot of faithfulness and obscurity to take out. So where are you today? What giant do you need to kill? What does this rock represent to you? What are you deciding today? You know what? I'm done. I'm taking this out. I'm taking this out of my life. What faithfulness do you need to embrace? And maybe today you even need to start by accepting what our Savior has done for us and taking out the giant of sin in our life. He's the one that made that possible. Would you bow your heads all over this place? If you're here today, you're watching online. Maybe you're out in our cafe right now. Maybe you're sitting in the mother's room. But you're at the sound of my voice. And there are things in your life that have been looming over you. Maybe even been handed down to you. And today you need an infusion of Holy Spirit power and courage. To first of all know that you can be faithful. That God is doing more in obscurity than you can imagine. He is preparing you for something. And that there are giants in your life that can be taken out, that don't have to stay there anymore. 
Maybe that's you today. There's something in your life that you're facing. But maybe you're here. And you say, I can't face it without him. The secret to David's success was the relationship with God that he had. And maybe today you're ready to begin a relationship. If that's you, I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer right where you are. Pray it with with boldness, sincerity. Decide. Today is the day. This day. I'm making a decision this day. I'm done playing. I'm done one foot in, one foot out. Like I'm going to serve you, God, as Lord of my life. I'm going to trust you. If that's you, I'm going to invite you to pray this out. You can say, Jesus, I give you my life. I give you control. Forgive me for all my sins, for trying to do life my way. I believe you died for me and you rose from the dead to give me new life. I receive it now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you made that decision today, please, this isn't just a formality. Please don't leave without letting someone know. Let myself or somebody at the Welcome Center, whoever you came with, you can text the word decision to the number on the screen. We want to come alongside you because there are going to be things in your life you need to face. And I I love that song we sang earlier, right? Like, though none go with me, still I will follow. But I'm thankful that God has called us to not go alone. And ultimately, like, we we have a people that we are called to walk with, and it's called the church. And so I invite you in to that. The rest of us, I'm going to invite us to stand all over this place. We're going to go out. We're going to check out serve day tables. We're going to sign up. But before we do that, we're going to worship. And I'm going to ask you to get your rock in your hand. Nobody leave right now. Get your rock in your hand. I'm going to invite you to just close your eyes. Holy Spirit, help us to name this. Let it be symbolic today of something that you are doing on the the inside of us, something you are trying to break off of our life, something you're trying to get us to see. Help us to name it. And Holy Spirit, I pray an infusion of your power and holy courage would grip our hearts. God, to be faithful where we are, where nobody else can see. God, so that we can allow you to do what you need to do. God, we love you. We trust you. God, help us to deal with the things in our life so that the next generation doesn't have to. Give us courage as a people. God, to slay giants and to be faithful in obscurity. In Jesus' name, amen. thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children Come on, sir. may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations
church, if you will, just open your hands. I just want to pray this blessing over you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Turn his face towards you. His face shine upon you. Give you peace. God, let us receive and know that we have favor with you. That you have blessed us. You are the peace and hope that we need. In Jesus' name, everybody said.